Have you lost weight only to gain it right back after returning to your routine? Did your diet work for someone else but not you? Rockin' That ID Life helps you understand your genetic makeup to find a lifestyle that fits your needs. Together, you and RockinThatIDLife.com can focus on your health and meet your goals today. That's RockinThatIDLife.com. Center Ice Brewery is a proud sponsor of Let's Go Blues Radio. If you haven't heard, Center Ice Brewery beer is now exclusively available at beer stores around town. So make sure you pick some up on your next milk and eggs run. That's Center Ice Brewery. Please drink responsibly. This is the summer edition of Let's Go Blues Radio, and I am your host, Jeff Ponder. No Kurt Price or Bill Day. That's the way we like it, and that's the way it's going to stay. Make sure uh, you stay tuned in with me all summer as I bring you exclusive hockey content you won't find anywhere else. Of course, I say that, and a good chance next week, Kurt and Bill will be back for a live show, but we will see. I uh, had said that going into this week uh, that uh, we would have a live show this week, thinking the draft was going to be when it normally is, but I forgot you got to basically add an extra week, two weeks, with the way this season went on. So, yes, hopefully they'll be back next week. If not, uh, definitely the week after that, because that'll be free agency. Uh, support for Let's Go Blues Radio is brought to you in part by RockinThatIDLife.com, where we help you make every workout, every meal count, do life better. And by CenterIceBrewery.com, St. Louis's wonderfully, craft hockey th- wonderfully crafted hockey-themed beer found at local grocery stores and liquor stores in the St. Louis area. Uh, This is franchise episode number 364 all time. This is season 10, episode 46. Uh, So uh, we've got got the draft coming up, so we got a big episode here where we kind of preview where the Blues will be picking, who they might be picking, names to watch out for, some great stuff from our guests. He provides some Real excellent insight into uh, maybe names you haven't heard before that maybe you should be paying attention to in this upcoming draft. Also, obviously, talk about the big names, the Shane Wrights, guys like that. Um, So, uh, first of all, this is hard to say, but it probably needs to be said. Congratulations to the Colorado Avalanche on your 2022 Stanley Cup. Um, I mean... I'm not a fan of Nathan McKinnon one bit. I don't like his leadership style. I, I feel it borders on um, uh, just, I don't know, crazy behavior with your teammates. I just don't like, uh, you know, basically telling them what they can and can't eat, not to smile for certain pictures. I'm just not a fan of it. And then obviously, I don't care what anyone says. I don't care that he's now a hero somehow. And I've said this on the show before. Go back to those episodes. You want to hear my real thoughts on Nazem Kadri. I hate him. Uh, not a fan of him. I hope he goes back to the Eastern Conference because I want to see him less. Uh, just not a player. You know, you've got those guys, that, that those rivals that you play against that, you know, the Jamie Benz. I know Kurt likes to point out that I'm a fan of his, but I, I love playing against him because I hate him when I play against him, when the Blues play against him. It's just fun. It's a fun rivalry. I don't feel that way with Nazem Kadri. Uh, just not a fan of the way he plays the game. I don't like my uh, my team being in peril every time that dude's on the ice. So uh, good for Eric Johnson. I'll say that. Good for Eric Johnson. Uh, glad he won one. Former Blue, obviously a big part of that uh, rebuild. Whether he stayed here or not, still brought in Kevin Shattenkirk, which led to Zach Sanford, Stanley Cup champion. Uh, and then, of course, uh, fuck Zach, uh, Stan Kroenke. Uh, just uh, nothing I need to say other than that. So I hated seeing his team win. That's the biggest reason I didn't want the Avalanche to win. I don't want to see his team have teams have any success. And obviously we've seen it twice this year. Uh, but uh, loved Kale McCarr kind of snubbing him, whether it was on purpose or not. I don't think it was when he got his con Smythe. Uh, so if you didn't see that, there's video floating around out there. Uh, basically Stan Kroenke trying to shake his hand and him just skating right by him and going to his teammates. So, Loved seeing that. Uh, again, whether it was intentional or not, I don't care. Still fun to see. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so congrats, Colorado Avalanche, I guess. Uh, another congrats goes out to the Hall of Fame inductees. Henrik and Daniel Sedin will join Roberto Luongo, Daniel Alfredson, Hannah Rika Salinen, and Herb Carnegie, all inducted into the 2022 class 
which is very exciting. Uh, obviously, we know the accolades, accolades of Dan, Daniel and Henrik Sedin, as well as their former teammate, Roberto Luongo, one of my favorite players of all time. Uh, and then Danny Elf obviously had a great career with Ottawa and, De- well, Detroit, but more so Ottawa. Um, but I uh, want to talk a little bit about the ones that people may not know much about. So uh, Hannah Rika Sleenen is a Finnish women's hockey icon, played 11 seasons in the Nystan SM Sarja. I'm probably butchering that. That's the elite league for women in Finland. She's a five-time champion. She won Olympic bronze with Finland in 1998 and 2018, so shows that her longevity as a player. In fact, at Pyeongchang, uh, which was in 2018, she was the oldest player of any gender to win a medal in ice hockey, uh, passing her uh, fellow countryman, Timu Salani. She was 44, so... Uh, obviously an icon in, in women's hockey and, and in uh, European women's hockey especially. So congrats to her. Herb Carnegie was a Canadian player of Jamaican descent who starred outside of the NHL. He unfortunately uh, did pass away in March of 2012. But uh, something that I noticed, it was actually in a TSN article, apparently Jean Beliveau played with him in semi-pro with the Quebec Aces. And uh, he called him one of the best skaters he ever played with while both were uh, playing for the Quebec Aces. So uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, also, apparently, he was part of the first ever all-black line in semi-pro hockey, and well, in any pro hockey. Uh, so clearly a, um, a builder uh, of the sport, uh, somebody that's uh, you know a big part of, of, uh, of uh, hockey is for everyone. So uh, congrats to them as well. But again, the Sedins, Luongo, Alfredson, all played for Canadian teams, which I'm sure Canada loved, but obviously Luongo kind of made a name for himself in Florida. And, uh, you know, Henrik and Daniel, just the way they played in Vancouver, should have won a cup. That team should have uh, in, uh, was that 2012 when they lost? But uh, just, uh, you know, none of those guys, unfortunately, won a Stanley Cup, but all deserving players and some of the best names to ever go down that had not won a Stanley Cup. Uh, so in this week's episode, let's get into it. We talk with Mike uh, Morial of NHL.com and the NHL Draft Class Podcast, which is a podcast featured over on NHL.com. So if you go to the podcast section, you'll see it featured in there. Uh, we discuss the upcoming draft, where the Blues are picking, and uh, what you can expect next weekend. So that is uh, the first full weekend in July. Actually, I'm sorry, that is the second full weekend in July. It's July 1st. It's Friday. Uh, but yeah, next weekend, so the 7th and 8th, we will be having the NHL draft. So uh, very exciting to uh, to talk to Mike. He's obviously a, quite the guru in terms of draft prospects and, and drafting in general. Uh, you're going to love this interview. Uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of St. Louis hockey content uh, to start the summer. But this one, this is back to our roots. This is talking hockey. This is talking blues, what you can expect at the draft. So uh, definitely stay tuned for this episode. Remember, we uh, bring you this type of content and more throughout the summer. So keep tuning in as we will have a new show every single week. Before we get to Mike, we do need to take a break and hear from our wonderful sponsors from RockinThatIDLife.com and Center Ice Brewery. It's springtime, and I know in my house, it's such a good feeling to open up the windows and let the breeze roll in for new life in my home. Your body's no different. Detoxifying your body can reduce any inflammation, purify your blood, help with weight loss, improve sleep, and boost your circulation. Don't just go after those detoxifiers that only focus on the gut and bowel, though. If you're going to do it, do it for real. The all-new Detox Box from RockinThatIDLife.com cleans all your systems, flushing your kidneys and bowels, detoxifying your liver, and restoring your microbiome for full homeostasis. You'll feel re-energized, restored, and renewed. Make your order now and receive a free Detox water bottle with your order. Visit RockinThatIDLife.com or email Dustin at RockinThatIDLife at gmail.com and tell him Let's Go Blues Radio sent you to receive an additional 10% off your order. That's RockinThatIDLife.com and give your body that much-needed spring cleaning today. Do you like hockey? Of course you do. 
Do you like beer? Of course you do. Are you 21? Let's hope so. If you answered yes to all of those questions, run on down to your local beer distributor and pick up a 2-4 of Old Arena Lager, the Beauty IPA, or any other delicious hockey-themed beer from Center Ice Brewery. That's right, Center Ice Brewery beer is available at various beer stores around town. So check around for the one closest to you. That's Center Ice Brewery. Let's go Blues. And for our interview portion of the show today, I am joined by Mike Morial, a uh, staff writer over at NHL.com since 2008, co-host of the NHL Draft Class podcast found on NHL.com. Uh, he's kind of a, a, a guru when it comes to your draft analysis at NHL.com, so he clearly knows the stuff if the NHL is going to trust him. Um, but before we get to that, way more important, New Jersey High School Ice Hockey Hall of Fame member. <laughs> Explain yourself. That's interesting. Oh wow, that's 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 a that was that's a great opening question there, Jeff. Thank you for that, and I, I appreciate being on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, you know, I covered high school hockey for the local paper here in New Jersey, the Star Ledger, the Newark Star Ledger, uh, for 17 years. I did high school hockey. I did all kinds of high school sports, but hockey was my love at the time. And to make a, a, a very long story short, um, there were about maybe 48 to 55 high schools uh, in the state of New Jersey at the time I started covering high school hockey. And there were several great players that I had the pleasure of covering, uh, James Van Riemsdyk. Uh, you know, he was with Christian Brothers Academy in, in Lincroft. Uh, you know, Del Barton had George Paros. Uh, he was a big checker then in high school. And now, Georgie is uh, obviously working for the NHL and, and player safety. Um, Kyle Palmieri, uh, now a member of the New York Islanders, played with St. Peter's Prep in Jersey City. Uh, a lot, a lot of good players from Jersey. People don't realize it, but uh, yeah, there were some exceptional players. They were fun to cover. I enjoyed my time covering high school hockey. And right now, uh, I've been out of the loop of, uh, you know, like I said, I covered it for 17 years been out of the loop now since I joined NHL.com in, in 2008. And right now there are over 175 high schools in New Jersey. So that are playing high school hockey. Uh, so uh, I, I, it's nice to maybe have played a little part in that. And I was so honored and privileged when they gave me the call and said, Mike, uh, you know, we'd like to, uh, uh, you know, and, in, and in, induct you into the New Jersey high school ice hockey hall of fame. And, it's something that, you know, I don't take for granted. Every time I go to Prudential Center, they have a little section in there, Jeff, uh, all the high school hockey Hall of Famers. And it's nice to bring my kids and my wife and family members when we go and we just kind of look and reminisce. And I have some old stories, but it's it, it's really cool. i um, very happy to be, uh, you know, inducted into the Hall of Fame for sure. Yeah, there's definitely some some dang good players that have come out of there, as you mentioned a few. Um, I know I. Uh, uh, I used to do work actually uh, in New Jersey. I'd fly in about once every two or three months. And um, and yeah, every time I'd stop into an ice hockey rink, there was a high school team practicing. So I'm <laughs> like, these kids just, there's just no break. I mean, there's, there's what, probably seven or eight at least ice hockey rinks in the area. And they were always booked with high school hockey players. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the thing. And that's what made it so remarkable is the fact there, there were so few rinks. Some of these rinks, as you know, are outdoors. So you have kids, parents driving their kids to these outdoor rinks at five in the morning, four 30 before school. So they can get a, an hour long practice. And it's, it's a lot of dedication, much like you see now with NHL players and what they need to do to get to that highest level and to compete at that highest level for that big prize. Um, but uh, it was just it was just real real cool to to cover the athletes and it, it's always nice when you get a new core of players just like we do now with NHL prospects for the NHL draft when I'm preparing each year it's a new core of players right it's it's not the same old players so it's really cool really cool yep yeah it is uh, so obviously your your uh, uh, roots started with high school hockey in New Jersey now you're doing draft analysis for NHL.com you've been obviously doing that for a while. Was that kind of the parlay? Was it, hey, we need this guy who kind of understands development, writing about player development in high school, and moving into the draft work that you've been doing? Well, that was something when I came aboard on .com. Originally, I was just doing basic storytelling, um, 
features on certain teams uh, when they came about. I would obviously uh, cover the New Jersey Devils whenever the opportunity uh, arose. Uh, all the home games, I would I would cover the Devils, which was which was great. Um, and then I guess two two years into you know I, I, I had a chance to go to to the scouting combines and see what that was all about. Um, I had a chance to, to cover because um, they were asking, does anyone want to do the Canadian Hockey League top prospects game, the All-American game with the top USHL and uh, NTDP UA team players will be competing, high school players, Midwestern uh, and Minnesota, Michigan, all the high school kids uh, would attend. And that was my MO, uh, you know, being – you know, a writer for high school hockey, it was things, it was something I loved to do. So I figured, Hey, you know, why not, uh, why not give it a shot here for, for NHL.com and see where it leads me. And, and lo and behold, uh, it, it's given me this opportunity to now kind of grasp and, and take control along with my colleague, Adam Kimmelman. We do a lot of the draft content that you see on NHL.com and, uh, the NHL draft class podcast as well. Uh, is in its fourth year of existence, so that's been something that's been a lot of fun to do. And it's just, it's just as we were talking to uh, about earlier, Jeff. It's, it's an opportunity to kind of get some thoughts that are in my head. Maybe I can't get down on paper. I uh, don't care too much to get down on paper. That I could just relay uh, in an audio form in a podcast is something I really enjoy doing. And I think the fans really gravitate to that too because they want to learn about players and prospects uh, that'll soon be in, within their organizations or that have a chance to be within their organization. Cause you never know. Right. Yeah. Uh, and particularly this year, we have a draft finally after, you know, two years of, of doing it virtually, we're going to have a live draft and to be down on the floor. And maybe there's trades that are going to take place, which is always neat and fun uh, to throw into a, to an NHL draft along with following these prospects. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's, it, it's really enjoyable to do, and, and I, I feel very grateful to be doing it for, for NHL.com and the National Hockey League. Yeah, I mean, I, I've covered drafts uh, a couple in my day, and, and uh, I've always said those are my favorite events to attend in terms of NHL. Obviously, playoff games are great. The award show is great. Everything's great that you can do, but the draft, it's just it's so much more intimate to me than anything else because, you're yeah. like you said, you're right down on the floor, I mean, I remember my first draft. It was my first NHL event experience outside of a regular season game. And mm. I remember just walking up. I had my backpack on, headphones in, trying to go <laughs> find where I should go sit. And there's Brendan Shanahan and Steve Eiserman just standing there talking, eating bagels. And I'm like, <laughs> whoa, wait, what? what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, nice. this is like the area for everybody. This isn't just the media section. So it was, <laughs> it was really cool to just walk by and just see these prolific hall of famers now owners and and presidents and gms just conversing you know just just oh wow they're in their element right now and, and here i am standing right by them like it was just yeah. crazy to me it, it's there's something to be said too and that's that's incredible uh i love those stories when you're able to to meet up with a general manager like to see lou lamarillo walking by and say hey mike how's it going uh you know down on the draft floor it, it's just really really cool but also, Jeff, it's it's just the opportunity to looking back. Like I can look back now and say that you know, after Connor McDavid was drafted, or Austin Matthews went number one, Jack Hughes, even uh, John Tavares, uh, I was there for. That was one of my one of my first drafts that I attended in Ottawa. It, you know, it really takes you back, and and you're really glad to be able to you know, follow the path of these players that now, you know, you look at what McDavid's doing and, and Austin Matthews, uh, you know, the Hart Trophy winner. It's amazing to see to see them and to say that, hey, you know, I knew these players when and and they used to, you know, I was the guy that they talked to. And, and a lot of times, and even James Van Riemsdyk, when I still see him today, uh, I covered him in high school, covered him, you know, when he was drafted by the Flyers, then went to the, the, the Maple Leafs, back with the Flyers. Whenever I go into the locker room, he still refers to me as Mr. Moriel, which which I think is really cool. <laughs> and every so often, I do tell him, I says, uh, you know, all right, all right, you know, JVR, it's it's all right. You can call me Mike. We're, we're on first, you know, first name basis here uh, <laughs> now that you're a professional. So, um, but it, it's really it's really kind of neat, and and it just goes to show you how respectful these players are in the league. Yeah, yeah, they are. They they all they always have been. They always will be. I think they they are always yep. raised right. So speaking of uh, the upcoming draft here in 2022, um, 
actually, first I want to ask you in terms of how you've had to cover the draft the last two years versus how it's going back to now the way that I used to cover it. You're back in the arena. You're you're you know you're in Montreal this year. Um, what? Uh, how does that change your coverage in terms of how how does it make it better? Because clearly, I'm sure it does. Yes, yes, it does. The past the past two years with the draft being uh, virtual, obviously no media members there, and you know what, Jeff, and you could speak to this as well. It's it it's 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 okay to to get players, general managers on on a Zoom call, but let's face it, everyone's getting the same content, so you can't really dive into a player and and maybe talk about something that is a little different from what another writer might be getting. Um, and that's something that I always enjoy, maybe digging in a little deeper than just, hey, you know, what was it like being selected number one in the draft? Or maybe dive in a little more to, to what parents are saying, you know, maybe uh, some of his friends that are might be uh, direct messaging him at the time, what they're saying or who he's direct messaging or things like that that make it make it interesting and, and uh, you're able to talk face to face. And the thing that I enjoy most and that we're, we're so um, – you know, that benefits us at dot com. And a lot of a lot of the outlets do get this. Sportsnet, um, you know, ESPN's gonna get this this year as well. Um, you know, when the players come through the different media outlets after being selected, they'll sit down with us, uh, each of the players that are selected in the first round, and we'll get to speak with each of them for maybe five to ten minutes. It'll give us an opportunity to maybe get some sound bites for our for our podcast. And not only that, uh, be able to get, as I said, some quotes and maybe some different unique type of things that these players are feeling at the time in, in stories that we'll have upcoming on dot com uh, after the first round of the draft and leading into day two uh, on July 8th. So um, in that way, it's it's very fulfilling. That's what makes the draft so enjoyable uh, for us. And, and just being there around people, right? <laughs> just just being able to talk to y- your colleagues from other outlets um, you know, how's it going? You know, what, what are you hearing? Is there going to be a trade here? It's just a whole different dynamic of being at the draft and being able to share the experience, not only with the people you work with, but, but others that you've been around with the entire season and have the same type of, uh, interests as you, but are able to get different type of storylines, um, in a live draft. So, and every so often, if you're lucky, a GM or maybe a, a head amateur scout will come walking by uh, on the on the draft floor, and you can you know catch up with them. How's it going? What's going on? Can you give me any insight? And sometimes you get that insight. Now, as a writer for dot com, I'm not able to maybe tweet some of that stuff out or express it in a story as easily as maybe another outlet, just because I'm working for the league. Um, but that being said, I still enjoy maybe getting a little bit of the insight in that regard. And it, it always makes it makes it for a more enjoyable draft and experience for sure. So we're going to talk about uh, the Blues in particular, who they might end up with. And I'll mention, too, where the uh, Blues will be selecting this draft. But first, I want to talk to you about um, Shane Wright uh, out of Kingston, OHL. He's a uh, centerman. And uh, he's been kind of getting the hype as the number one. Um, can, what can you tell me about his game? And do you see any of the other names below him possibly stepping in and taking that number one spot? Or is he solidified as number one? Yeah, well, well, for me, like, I, obviously, I, I can't tell you who Montreal is going to take. But personally, I like Shane Wright as, as, as the number one player in this draft. Jeff, there, there's just a completeness about Shane's game. To, to which he has the this ability to to rise to the level of play required to get results, wh- whether it's with his speed, his quick hockey wits, or just competing with kind of like a never give up approach. He plays with a, a level of confidence, poise, um, lead the you know he he knows how to lead his team. You know, I'd best sum it up by you know saying that the one constant factor in his favor is whenever Shane Wright has the puck on his stick, something good's going to happen. He, he makes skill plays, will be rewarded even more when he plays besides players capable of, of reading and reacting as he does. And I think that's important because, of course, obviously the Ontario Hockey League, they canceled their season last year. So Shane Wright didn't have a, a, a full season. And you can read about it too on NHL.com. I have a, a story up uh, right now on Shane Wright 
um, and what he had to go through to kind of get to this point in his career. Um, but yeah, he missed an entire season. OHL canceled the season because of COVID. Came back um, this year, scored a little over uh, you know ninety points uh, this year. Had a real good playoff as well. Um, but I think there, you know, there is there were these criticisms about his game that he wasn't. Um, I don't know. He maybe wasn't playing a, the complete game that people wanted to see on it consistently, game in and game out. And I would say to those people, that's you know, Shane Wright is that kind of guy. And he even said this during the uh, at the NHL Combine with us, Jeff, that you know he, he's he's a methodical thinker out there. His IQ is off the charts. So he's going to go out there. He's going to think about what he needs to do and make the appropriate plays. He's not just going to go to a space on the ice because it's open. He'll go to spaces where he can retrieve pucks, where he can give teammates, uh, you know, the puck in good spots, good positions. And uh, I do believe that if he were a little more selfish this year as well, he would have had 50 goals, 140 points. But that's not his DNA. He, he He's not that type of player. Um, he's a two-way guy. Since the age of six, he's been playing up a level. So he's very mature for his age and, and what he needs to do. Uh, you know, as as as, as uh, in regards to a point of attack, uh, and what he needs to do in the offensive end, one of the most complete two way players. I, I spoke to you know Craig Button, who does a lot of the great work for TSN. He's a good friend of mine, and, and we talk about Shane Wright all the time. And he he compares him a little bit to Patrice Bergeron and what Patrice was able to do with the Boston Bruins and the approach he has to the game. And I would say this: like there aren't many times when you watch Patrice Bergeron, that you're being lifted out of your seat and saying, oh my gosh, what a great play. It's just the things he does consistently well. And that's how I feel Shane Wright will be in the NHL when he's playing with NHL-type players that can think the game on his level. Yeah, I remember uh, back when the Blues were playing the Bruins in 2019, I was having a conversation with a friend and and uh, he had said, you know, you know, and he was kind of a casual hockey fan. He's like, you know, everyone talks about how great Bergeron is. I don't really notice him out there. And I'm like, watch for 37 next game. Tell me what you see. And he called me right after, I think it was game three or game four. And he was just like, okay, that guy's always in the right position. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, he's he's not making your Datsuki in plays, but he's he's where he needs to be. And it sounds right. like this is how Shane's right, Shane Wright plays the game as well. Yes. Yeah. No, no doubt about it. You, you know, you can, you know, you can't, you can't really measure mental effort on the ice. It's something that you just have to see as a scout, a guy that's been in the business for a long time. And I'm not calling myself an expert by any means. I, I talk to the experts at NHL central scouting. I watch video. I've seen players as well. I talk to some of the, the, the scouts with the NHL clubs as well. Um, and the mental makeup of this kid is second to none. And as I said, there are some question marks about his consistency this season, but I think I've laid out, you know, the, the ideas that I feel as the why Shane Wright here should be the number one pick. There are some other great options here, and I'm not saying that the Canadians aren't going to select any of those other players like a Yuri Slavkovsky, a Logan Cooley from the NTDP, or even a Simon Nemitz uh, from Nitra in Slovakia. All great players. And all could be deserving of that number one pick. But for me, I would go Shane Wright. So talking about where the Blues are at in this draft, uh, they have five picks. Pick first at uh, number 23 in the first round. So Blues fans will have to wait a little while after they tune into coverage. But uh, plenty of names that have come up, I think, with uh, with the Blues and seeing kind of where they're going to pick. Clearly things can change with trades, but you know we can only speculate about that. So a couple names that I've seen come up a lot, Seamus Casey and Ryan Chesley, defenseman out of uh, the USA under 18 club, as well as a name, I might be butchering this here, Nathan Gocher, uh, six foot three forward um, out of Quebec. Uh, but in terms of maybe your mock drafts, where you see teams slotting with players, uh, who's somebody you're kind of eyeing for the Blues at 23? Yeah, for that 23 spot, it's going to be interesting. I, th I do think this is a deep draft too, Jeff. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying, uh, some of the pundits are saying that maybe it kind of drops off a little bit after the middle half of the first round. Um, I, I do think there's talent here that uh, beyond the first round, you're going to get diamonds in the rough. Just for the simple fact that after missing and some cancellations and postponements uh, in, in 2021, 
um, a lot of those players came back this year and were able to showcase their skills and what they were able to do. So a lot of the scouts were able to see more of these players. They were able to, you know, show what they were able to do, particularly uh, overseas on the international side of things as well. So I think it's a pretty deep draft. I, I think you may see some of those diamonds in the rough um, late in the first round, second round, because maybe they've been overlooked because of, you know, the past few seasons with the pandemic and what's been going on. But, you know, as far as that 23 spot, you hit one of the players there that could be in that area, Nathan Gaucher, with, you know, with Ryan O'Reilly's 31, uh, Braden Shen is 30. Each in that range, it might be time to start thinking of the future through the middle of the ice. You know, Gaucher is a big, strong center who would fit well with the Blues' physical, hard-checking, Craig Berube-type uh, style of play. I like this kid uh, in your garden, uh, their junior team in uh, Sweden's junior league, Liam Ogram. He's a left wing, real explosive skater with speed, acceleration, balance. He goes about 6'1", 201. And I think if, if the Blues did, I, I, I think he may go, could go a little higher in this draft, but he could be a steal for the Blues at, at this point if they're able to get him. He plays with a lot of energy, just what Craig Berube likes, is strong on the forecheck, has a great work ethic, and he scored 58 points in 30 games uh, in Sweden's Junior League. Uh, there's a kid from Mississauga, and besides the national team development program, Jeff, I got to tell you, you know, the national team development program is probably the most uh, scouted, evaluated uh, club um, heading into each draft season. The second most club is usually Mississauga in the Ontario Hockey League. Uh, and, of course, they're they're close in Toronto, so that's probably another reason why Mississauga is so well scouted. But Luca Del Bell Belouz, the center there, he, he goes about six foot. 179 pounds, good skater, strong puck control, quick hands that make him effective in, in, in a lot of tight spaces, a very committed 200-foot 200 uh, foot player. So uh, he's another player that could be in this range. And then I'll throw in one national team development program player who could be in this range as well because the record for NTDB players taken in the first round was in 2019, the Jack Hughes draft, Trevor, Trevor Zegers, uh, Cole Caulfield. There were eight players taken in the first round that, uh, that year. This year, there were nine players ranked in Central Scouting's North American side uh, that could possibly go in the first round. I think there may go, there may be maybe six or seven. I don't know if they're going to break the record, but it's going to be close. Jimmy Snuggerud made tremendous uh, strides. He's a he's a left wing with the NTDP. His skating really improved over the second half of the season. Uh, was second on the on the program with seven power play goals this year. And he had a goal and a, and a, and a game-high step shots at the, the BioSteel American Prospects game. Ceiling is really high because of all the elements that are there for a long, successful NHL career. And I think, I think all the fans and everyone understands here too, Jeff, that when you're picking, you know, 20, 21 to 23, these are players, even if you get after, you know, pick number five, six, uh, these are players that need a little bit more developing, a little bit, a little bit more maturing. Um, that's what makes the NHL draft so unique and difficult to gauge because you're trying to project where these players are going to be in three, four, five years. And when you're picking at 23, don't expect the player to be, uh, you know, in your lineup necessarily in, in one, two years, but give it some time and eventually they'll, they'll prosper as long as they have that proper development and mature, you know, that mature game and, and, and the player development for that particular NHL club is doing their due diligence to make sure their player is learning how they want them to learn. Well, I'll say the names that you've thrown out at the very least are very awesome names. So as a hockey fan, <laughs> we can all get excited about that. There's some cool names that might be coming into the NHL. Um, yeah. And, and I'll say the blues have been picking uh, again. We mentioned uh, they're at 23, but they're also have third, fourth, fifth, and sixth round picks. Second round pick was traded this past year for uh, Pavel Buchnevich, which I think worked out for them. Um, yes. But uh, <laughs> I think you would agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. Very good trade for the Blues. But um, in terms of uh, just, and maybe this is just an overall overarching team question for you, but with with maybe your later round picks, maybe even if you have a late first round pick, what are you most drafting for? Are you looking at, okay, where are our holes going to be next season, two years out, three years out? Who's the best available now? 
Uh, in term, and obviously teams have their own different strategies, but from what you've seen, what's something that would probably fit the mold for the Blues uh, going forward in this draft? Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I mean, there's going to be quite a few players in this draft that are going to go later that, you know, four or five years from now will be saying, how in the heck did this player, you know, go in the, in the middle of the second round or the middle of the third round? I honestly believe, believe Jeff, that we're going to see um, a real high percentage of those players. And I think this draft is going to be the highest percentage of any draft we've ever seen of players that are playing and playing particularly well, earning a lot of ice time, playing maybe over 500 games that are drafted second round, third round. So to get those late picks in this year's draft was probably a coup in everyone's uh, hat, a uh, feather in everyone's hat, uh, if they were able to do so. A couple of players that I think, you know, could, or, or I should say that are interesting, um, who could go, you know, late, uh, whether it be third round, second round. This kid, Reed Schaefer, a left wing from Seattle in the Western Hockey League. Um, everyone can bolster their pipeline with, with power forwards on the left side. You know, Schaefer goes about 6'3", 213. He really popped this season. Good at protecting the puck. Uh, strong along the boards and in front of the net, uh, scored 32 goals, uh, had 58 points, led all WHL rookies with, with four shorties uh, this year. Um, so Reed Schaefer is a player that, you know, could be that player, you know, mid-second round. Uh, if he falls a little more, could be even better. Um, Lane Hudson. Now, this is a player that's been kind of on everyone's radar because he goes about 5'8", 148 pounds, plays for the National Team Development Program. U18 team, and it's because of that size that everyone's saying, gosh, you know, is this going to be a detriment to Lane? But I'm telling you right now, Jeff, this is one of the, the better skaters of this draft class as far as defense goes. Um, I've had some scouts tell me that this player, if he were maybe two inches taller uh, at 5'11", even, um, he could be considered among, you know, that top three, top four picks of this draft class. So, Elusive skater. He can play the quarterback on the power play. Great speed. Tremendous work ethic. He also was the recipient of the E.J. McGuire Award of Excellence um, as the draft eligible prospect uh, who best exemplifies uh, commitment to excellence through strength of character, competitiveness, athleticism. So uh, Hudson's going to Boston University in, in 22-23. So he's another player that I think could be, you know, gotten here late. Another interesting uh, talking point that's being brought up is where are all these Russian players going to go in this draft? I mean, obviously we have the war going on. Uh, you know, Russia's not involved in the World Junior Championship. Um, you know, uh, Deputy Commissioner Bill Daly said that those Russian players on on Colorado won't be able to take the cup to Russia uh, for their summer with Stanley uh, in the summer. So uh, a lot going on here with, with Russia and, and the players. Um, and there are a few dynamic Russian players. Uh, Ivan Merichichenko, the left wing from Omsk in Russia's second division, right-handed shot, goes about 6'1", 185. Everyone knows he was diagnosed with, with Hodgkin, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma in February uh, after he had 16 points in 31 games uh, in Russia's second division. And he's he's being and – and the reason why I bring up Merichichenko is he's being compared to Vlad. Tarasenko. Um, a, a lot of the scouts compare him to Tarasenko and and what Vlad has been able to do for the Blues uh, in his tenure. So Marisashenko has been cleared to resume his skating, his hockey training, um, but it's his shot. Many believe uh, is NHL ready right now. That might be his greatest asset. So I'm curious. I don't think, at least our mock drafts are coming out real soon on .com. I don't think Marisashenko is going to go in the first round. He originally was a pegged a top 10 selection, but because of the, the illness he had and the treatment, and now he's just getting back into things, it may take some time. So a lot of people are saying that maybe this is a player that falls in the second round or maybe even f uh, further. And if you're able to get him at that spot, why not give it a shot? And one other player I'll say, a defenseman, Tristan Lanou um, of Gatineau in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, goes about 6'1", 188, smart effective at both ends of the ice, transitions well, good at supporting the rush. Uh, he was named the QMJHL Defensive Rookie of the Year last season, um, but he had 43 points this year, 12 goals, 17 power play assists in 63 games. So a great asset right there for anyone looking for a power play type quarterback 
late in the draft. Um, someone that's just consistent, that has been consistently good and strong for his major junior club this season. Yeah, you mentioned the Russians. Uh, Blues have kind of made a push, I think, recently with uh, with Tarasenko obviously leading the charge, but Buchnevich, uh, Barbashev, uh, even a guy like Clem Costin yes. has been brought in in the past. I, I think that uh, that's definitely a name Blues fans should be looking out for because uh, you never know. Blues have shown before they have no problem taking Russians. No, uh, no. And, and obviously, and it would be a great pick, yeah. The treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma has greatly uh, improved over the years, so. That's another big, important thing to remember, too. Absolutely. Um, so I have to ask for the resident goalie on the panel who could not join us. His name's Bill Day. Uh, Bill's, uh, he's he's going to ask this question. I know. Why didn't you ask this question, Jeff? I'm going to ask you, Mike. Uh, when will a goalie be taken first in uh, this year's <laughs> draft? Yeah, you know, it, it, three straight years, we've had a goalie taken in the first round. Last year, we had two, right, Jeff? Uh, yep. Taken in the first round. So... Um, I think, though, it's going to be one of those years where it's just going to take some time uh, for these goalie prospects to develop. And not that it doesn't necessarily, but I don't see a goalie here that may go in the first round. Uh, I don't know that there's anyone in this mix that a team would be considering uh, using a first round pick. But there are, um, you know, a couple players here. Dylan Silverstein is making a good name for himself with consistent play with the national team development program under 18 team this year. Tyler Brennan of Prince George in the WHL. Uh, he was number one on NHL Central Scouting's North American list. Doesn't have the numbers, but we always see this. Like uh, many of these goalies in major junior, the USHL, college that are draft eligible, don't have like the sensational, spectacular numbers with goals against and save percentage. But that's could be because they're, you know, they're playing behind some defensive teams that are rookies, young players. It's not, there's no cohesion there for these, for these goalies. But the fact, fact of the matter is a lot of the scouts that look at these goalies look for things during, you know, pregame warmups. They look for how these players are reacting after goals that are allowed. Are they coming back strong? What are they doing? So I like uh, with Tyler Brennan, real good size from this goalie this year from Prince George. I think he's going to be one of the first, if not the first goalie taken off the board. Ivan Zhigalov. Uh, the Belarusian goalie came over and and, and was playing very really well uh, with Sherbrooke this year in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. He is uh, number two among the North American goalies right now. Um, uh, you know, he's a he's a guy that I can I, I would think maybe can go like a third or fourth round pick. Look, there are a lot of NHL clubs out there that you know their amateur scouting teams have told me that we like to to draft a goalie uh, somewhere in the draft every year just to have him develop, grow mature um you know we all know the story about you know jordan binnington and when he was drafted and how long it took him to finally get to the nhl you know it took an injury for him to finally get his chance and and then voila there he is and he's a bona fide starter and uh he did so much for the blues too in the playoff uh you know the playoffs this year um so i you know i i think these goalies really mature and are start start becoming NHL type players when maybe they turn 25, 26 years old. It takes a little bit more maturing. And also one other thing to consider, there's only, you know, the two best goalies of an organization are the only two on the ice, uh, you know, on the ice. One's a backup and one's a starter. It's not like defense where you have maybe six, seven, eight to deal with. Fords, of course, you have 12 out there. And the goaltenders, it's a starter and a backup. And that's all you have. So that's a, probably another reason, that, you know, it's a simple fact, but, it's probably another another reason why you don't see the goalies really come up after they're drafted until maybe four or five years down the road. And that and that's good for their development too. Yeah, you mentioned that was gonna be my point was Jordan Biddington, his numbers with Owen Sound were not great. Uh, if you look at the stats, but it's like, hey, he came in as a rookie and won a Stanley Cup. That's all you need to know. <laughs> and and like you said, yeah. had he not get injured this past playoff, who knows? The blues could have been the biggest combatant for uh, Colorado in this uh, playoff. So you never know. Um, yep. I, okay. So Mike, last question. Um, if you're on a high horse, I'm about to yank you off it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, one of my favorite stories to tell is I think it was the 2013 draft that I was attending and I jumped on another podcast and they asked me, cause I had followed that draft class very closely. Um, I was not, happy with a certain pick the Washington Capitals made. And I said, they wasted their first round pick. You're going for a home run in the first round and you bunted for a single. 
That player was Philip Forsberg. So <laughs> I uh, obviously had a major miss there in terms of what you have done in the past. Now, again, I'm pulling you off your high horse here. What's the biggest miss you think you've had when you've uh, been trying to make prospect claims in the drafts? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I, you know, well, I don't know. I don't know if you can call. Um, you know what? I'll tell you what, Jeff, I'll go right back to that to that 2013 draft. There was a player that the Florida Panthers uh, chose at the top of that draft class named uh, Alexander Barkov. And oh, yeah. I didn't have Bar I didn't have Bar. He went number two, Jeff, to, to the Panthers <laughs> that year. And that was McKinnon went number one to the Avalanche Barkov two. Uh, I believe the Lightning took uh, Jonathan Drouin, three. And then, of course, Seth Jones went four to the Preds. But I had Barkov going uh, – it, it had to be middle of the first round, late first round that year. And look at the uh, the player that Barkov has turned out to be, right? I mean, talk about a leader of a team, a leader of men, uh, you know. And, again, a guy that, you know, isn't from North America. He's coming from overseas. And um, – to do what he's done with the Florida Panthers, uh, I, I think is something special. And that leads me to like this year's draft too, Jeff. It's like I would compare this year's draft in some ways to that 2013 draft because, you know, where is Yuri Slavkovsky going to go in this draft? I mean, we all think like, you know, Shane Wright, we, we like Logan Cooley. Is Slavkovsky the, the, the second overall? Is he going to be third overall? He's that big left wing. Obviously, you know, teams like to build from the goaltender out, goalie D, or as far as forwards go, down the middle of the ice. And, and Slavkovsky is that winger, but he's a big, big winger, has done so much good good things with Slovakia, the international program, and TPS uh, in Liga uh, this year. So, um, you know, it's interesting. It's an interesting comparable now that I'm thinking about it. And, and you mentioned 2013, but definitely, I, you know, I would say Barkov was my big miss. I, I, I didn't anticipate Barkov going that early. And it goes to show this is why I, I always tell hockey fans who maybe I don't want to watch it. I'll look at the results later. <laughs> I think it's interesting to sit and watch and remember what the experts say, you know, the Craig buttons and all them say on the broadcast, Oh, this is a, a reach of a pick. You know, and you look back six years later and you're like, that wasn't a reach. That was a great wasn't pick a or, or the exact opposite. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's so much fun to pay attention to the coverage, as you said, in Canada on Sportsnet, in the U.S. on ESPN. Make sure you tune in for those second and uh, second through, was it seven rounds now, right? Uh, seven make sure rounds. you tune yeah. in for those now. Yeah, I always want to say nine, but I know that uh, those that's not the case anymore. <laughs> Brian Elliott would have never been drafted. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, I want to go ahead and give you a quick minute, Mike, to talk about your podcast, uh, the NHL draft class, which is featured on NHL.com. Where can people find you? And, uh, since this episode will be posted on Wednesday, June 29th, uh, go ahead and tell us anything that might be in the works before and, uh, after the draft. Yeah, thank thanks for that, Jeff. Uh, yeah, you, you can get NHL draft class, uh, on any of your, major platforms where you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify. Um, and you can also, uh, we always write, uh, have a little, uh, write up on who our guests are for that particular show on NHL.com. So you can always get it there. You can follow me on Twitter, Mike Mori uh, at Mike Moriel NHL. Um, and I'll have, uh, you know, links to all the podcasts. We have links to some sound bites to the podcast where you can also click on the full podcast and, and what it's all about. And, you know, this past month and past uh, month and a half, we'd had we've had guests uh, from NHL Central Scouting. We've we've spoken uh, to Joey Tanute, who evaluates prospects in the Ontario Hockey League. John Williams, the evaluator in the Western Hockey League. JF Danfoos, the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. Um, we've had all the the men that cover these prospects day in day out. All the travel work that they do. They know these guys inside out and, and what they're like on and off the ice. And it's real interesting when uh, my my colleague, my co-host, uh, Adam Kimmelman, and I, when we're talking to these scouts, how they evaluate these guys, what they think of them, where they think the projection will be, how the, how those those skills and assets that they have are transferable uh, to, to, to the NHL. So, the you know, it's a lot of fun to do the podcast. And, and, and upcoming, we, we've had – uh, episodes uh, at the NHL Central uh, Scouting Combine. We've had uh, talks with Shane Wright. We had we spoke with Logan Cooley, Yuri Slavkovsky. 
Um, and, and even uh, we spoke to Jack Hughes, too, the uh, son of uh, Montreal Canadiens GM Kent Hughes. Uh, so Jack Hughes, of course, has a similar name to, to, to the Jack over at the Devils. And, you know, I still remember asking Kent Hughes if, hey, you got the number one pick in the draft. Are you drafting your son? And he's like, I can guarantee you, Mike, we're not drafting our son with the first <laughs> overall pick. But hey, you know what, Jeff? Montreal has a lot of picks in this draft, so there is a yep. chance that they do get they do get Jack Hughes. But um, yeah, NHL draft class. You can look uh, look it up, uh, um, and it's a lot of fun to do to do the uh, to, to do the shows each week. Uh, and also your coverage over at NHL.com in terms of writing your columns. Uh, everybody can find everything there and follow you on Twitter, right? And uh, usually post anything new that comes up. Yes, yeah. Uh, I'm at, at Mike Moriel on HL. Uh, had some big stories on Yuri Slavkovsky two weeks ago. Last week we had Logan Cooley. I did a long read feature um, today, uh, June 28th. We're recording this. Uh, I had a story on Shane Wright today, a long feature, which tells all about, you know, him growing up and uh, some of the neat antidotes. And um, I thought one interesting note, side note there on, on Shane Wright was his dad, uh, Simon, told me that when he was real young, maybe seven, eight years old, uh, when they would go to the pool, um, Shane would jump into the pool and his dad would have to throw a ball and he'd try to catch the ball in midair before splashing into the pool. And he was so competitive. Shane was, he'd come out, of, come out of the pool and he'd ask his dad. So what was the rating on that? Like, what would you think of that catch after I got into the water? And, and his dad would use numbers of NHL players. So he'd say, Oh, that was a 9.1 out of 10, like 9.1 being a Steven Stamkos 91. He said, sometimes I'd give him a Gretzky, a 9.9. Other times it would be a McDavid, a 9.7. So just interesting stuff like that. I, I thought it was really cool. A lot of that in that story. So you can check that out on NHL.com as well as many other features. That's fantastic. Awesome. Uh, Mike, so I want to go ahead and give a shout out to our mutual friend and friend of Let's Go Blues Radio, Dan Rice, who covers the New Jersey Devils. He's the one who put us in touch. So I uh, want to give a little shout out to Dan there in case you're listening. I know you are. And uh, Mike, want to thank you again very much for coming on. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, again, make sure you follow him over on Twitter at Mike Morial NHL and check out the NHL Draft Class podcast which again is featured over at NHL.com. Read everything he has to write over there as well. So Mike, thank you very much for joining us. Look forward to having you on again sometime. Really appreciate this, Jeff. Thank you so much. So again, a big thanks goes out to Mike. Uh, he was awesome. And um, I will be uh, tracking a lot of those players that he mentioned, uh, seeing where they end up, because uh, some of those names that I hadn't heard were very intriguing, um, especially the the talk of the Russian players. So uh, should be interesting to see where they end up. Uh, remember, next week, Kurt and Bill might be back as we talk about the upcoming draft. Um, might be the next week, though, so we will have a live show coming up, folks, in the next two weeks, at least one, maybe two. So make sure you stay tuned for that because uh, it's going to be fun talking about whatever the Blues do here at the draft and free agency. Some of the best, some of the most fun we have on this show are in the next two weeks. So, uh, you know, stay tuned with us. It'll be fun. Uh, live probably Wednesday the next two weeks, but stay tuned on social media. We'll let you know if that changes. Support for Let's Go Blues Radio is brought to you in part by ID Life, the world's only truly personalized vitamin platform based on a health assessment of your DNA. Visit rockinthatidlife.com for more information. That's rockinthatidlife.com. And get 10% off by emailing Dustin at rockinthatidlife at gmail.com and tell him Let's Go Blues Radio sent you. And by Center Ice Brewery, which provides drinks brewed right here in St. Louis and is available throughout the city and county at numerous grocery stores, liquor stores, and bars. And, of course, during the season, they are also at Enterprise, Pre or Enter Enterprise Center, where the Blues play. Uh, visit CenterIceBrewery.com to find a vendor near you. That's CenterIceBrewery.com. That will do it for episode 46 of season 10 of the original St. Louis Blues Hockey Podcast, Let's Go Blues Radio. Thanks for listening, and don't forget, we'll be back with a show next week and the week after that, and the week after that, the week after that, the week after that. It's going to keep going, folks. It's going to keep going. For Kurt Price and Bill Day, I'm Jeff Ponder, and I will talk with you next week. This was Let's Go Blues Radio. Until next time, everyone, let's go blues. 
Uh, the Chiefs are at home tonight against Cyanusport at the War Memorial at 8. Good seats are still available. I'll look at sports. I think that went very well. Thank you for listening to Let's Go Blues Radio. Now take off, hosers. I want you to have a heart attack and die so that we never have to do this shit again. Well, there's 90 minutes of your life you'll never get back. Sorry. St. <laughs> Louis Blues, St. Louis Blues, have you heard the news about our St. Louis Blues? They've only just begun, they're on their way to number one, now there's no more blues for our St. Louis Blues. The blues are on the ice tonight again, they're rough and tough and got the stuff to win. They'll always get one more, no matter what the score. They are quite a hockey team, my friend. They never give a single goal away. And the Blue Day, they are champions every day. Because when it's said and done, they'll have them on the run. These old St. Louis Blues are here to stay. St. Louis Blues, St. Louis Blues. Have you heard the news about our St. Louis Blues? They've only just begun, they're on their way.